Thank you uh, both so much for taking the time to speak with me. It's a real pleasure to have and to, to have the opportunity. Good. Uh, so yeah, firstly, I really enjoyed the uh, the, the the book. It was uh, fascinating. I have read it once, and I'm going away. We've got a long weekend here. It's a public holiday on uh, on Monday, so I'm planning to read it a second time. It's uh, right. one of those uh, uh, books that uh, yeah, the the argument is fascinating, but I feel like I kind of need to read it a couple of times to fully absorb all of your of your points. But yeah, it's a real mm -hmm. privilege to uh, be able to ask you some questions about it. Good, thank you. Fantastic. Really Before we go, to... sorry. No, we are really pleased and thanks for talking to us, and it's great. Fantastic. Uh, where, where, where are both of you were uh, based in the uh, based in the world? Then where are you? Where are you calling in from? So I'm based in Buffalo, and Bert is the uh, press person in Buffalo who organised this. Oh, oh wonderful. Wonderful. So there's Bert. Um, so I've been a, a philosophy professor here in Buffalo for twenty five years. Oh, wonderful! Um, it, it took me a second to realize the uh, that to, to recognize the fellow English accent there. Right. Well, <laughs> oh, you can hear an ugly German accent from me, so I'm based in Cologne, Germany. Oh, terrific! Oh well, thank you very much for for staying up late then to uh, to have this conversation. Thank you. Um, well. Are you happy for me to go ahead and record the conversation from my end, just so I can make sure that I accurately oh. transcribe it? Absolutely, yes. yes. But we're wonderful. recording it too. I take it you have no objection to that. No, 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 absolutely. No, that would be that would be wonderful. That way we've got multiple sources of uh, to protect yeah. against failure. Yeah. Perfect. Right. Let me uh, let me quickly bring up my uh, my notes then and we can dive into uh, uh, questions. So I suppose maybe a good place to start uh, would be the most sort of basic point, which is just a sort of an introduction of, uh, 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 of both of you. I wondered if you would mind talking a little bit sort of about uh, what it is that you do and essentially kind of setting a bit of context for sort of where you came to this book from in terms of your 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 areas of expertise your you start yeah okay so basically um i'm can you hear me i yep. can hear you perfectly yes so i'm i'm by training a physician and mathematician and i came to mathematics via i mean i'm physician and biochemist and i when i started my career i did a big experiment a lot of experiments that generated a lot of data and then I started to learn mathematics and studied mathematics to be able to interpret these data and that that was in the end of my 20s and then or yeah mid mid to end 20s and then I, that was as a postdoc and I realized at that time how hard it is to model biological systems using mathematics so that was the time when I realized it for the first time because I basically tried all out on the data I had all the mathematical methods that exist there was always this misfit between you know the mathematical methods and and um, and the biological data, and so yes. I became a biomathematician, but it was somehow frustrating. In my and in my mid thirties, I left academia and and became a business consultant, and then I became an entrepreneur for for artificial intelligence software systems. And then again, I when I was trying to use AI, which is nothing but mathematics, to build AI systems. Um, to, you know, um, mimic what human beings can do. But then I realized I, I had the same feeling that I, have had, that I had had 15 years ago in biology. And it was so difficult again to, you know, use the mathematics to model what humans can do. I mean, yes. uh, in biology, it was other systems, not humans, but anyhow. And so, you know, customers said to me, why don't you build uh, chatbots? I said, because they won't work because we cannot model this type of system properly. And then they, they went, oh, but others are doing it. And you know that the others failed, right? Mm -hmm. Google failed, Microsoft failed, Facebook failed that with their chatbot. They turned into Nazis, the chatbots and so on. So yes. they had to switch them off. And and then, you know, I was <clears> I was frustrated by not being able to answer properly to this these customers why I didn't build such systems. Yes. And then, you know, that gave me the idea to write the book. And then I thought, I know the mathematics, I know the biology, I know a bit of philosophy, but not enough. And then Barry and I already knew each other for a while. And then I went to Barry and proposed to him to start working together. And that's how it came about. Now, that was a bit long, but I think it was a good way of also showing to you where our basic theory comes from. Absolutely. And, and, and Professor Smith? Yeah, so I uh, started life as a philosopher working in ontology. and. Uh, in around the year two, 2000, I um, 
started to work on the ontology of medicine. I, I established in Germany the world's first institute devoted to the ontology of medicine. And the point of that institute was to work out how we can use logical theories, basically, to help process medical data. So it was a, a kind of parallel to what Jobs was doing. One of the things I discovered there was that there were some rather um, dubious groups who were making money out of building bad models of medical data and then getting people to pay them when the, when the uh, data systems in hospitals broke. So they were deliberately breaking the thing and then getting paid to fix it. And Jobs became involved with those bad people. Uh, and then he discovered me and I had been writing about the, the mistakes that they were making. And uh, he contacted me. This was many years ago. 2010. Um, 10 years ago. And so we knew each other from that, but we lost contact. And then, as he says, about three years ago, he suddenly, did you call me? I think you called me on the phone. Yeah, I really, I, said, I, I know I, I asked you yeah. for a slot and then I called you. Yeah. yeah. So uh, he said, Barry, I need to come to Buffalo. I have a problem I need to talk to you about. So he described the problem as he just described it here. And he said, uh, we need to work on this problem together. And I, I thought it, it was a very interesting problem. I had already <clears throat> inklings of similar problems, but I had never thought them through. And so we thought we'd write a paper. And we did write a paper. Uh, it's called Making Artificial Intelligence Meaningful Again. Mm -hmm. uh, so this was in the, 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 uh, the Trump era. Yes. Uh, and um, it was accepted for publication almost immediately in a journal called Synthase, which is quite a prominent journal. And so, oh, we, we can write another paper. That The first paper was really just about the methods Jobs was using for yeah. his <coughs> extremely no, narrowly was, focused AI system. No, it was also about why neural networks fail for language modeling. Right, yeah. But mm -hmm. we didn't have the theory we have now, but we already showed that we listed, you know, more or less technically why it didn't work, but we, we had no idea of the deeper reasons it didn't work. Yeah. Yes. That time. And so we thought, oh, they accepted that paper and published it actually within four weeks. That was a, a kind of miracle. So we uh, wrote a longer paper uh, digging deep, more deeply, uh, and it was a, a paper about um, a kind of Wittgensteinian problem, namely, how do we succeed in communicating, given that everybody has comes with a different form of life, a different environment, a different understanding of what the world is for, what they are for. And that's why it's so um, uh, miraculous that we're able to communicate using language. So it was a very long paper um, and uh, it, it was rejected. Everybody. And then it was rejected again. And then uh, we thought, well, let's write a book that must be easier. And so, so it, it was already a very long paper uh, and it became part of one of the chapters in the book. Interesting. Um, but both we, of you, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. No, I, I was going to say, both of you uh, mentioned in different ways something that I've often found quite fascinating, which is the fact that certainly the formulation of AI, and I realized that this is one of these disciplines that's never fully had an agreed upon uh, sort of uh, goal in the sense that you had people from different disciplines who all had their own ends that they were interested in pursuing. I was fortunate enough that uh, certainly uh, here in the UK, I, I, I've been able to uh, sort of interview a lot of the, I suppose, kind of the first wave of British AI researchers yeah. who were kind of active in the 1960s and 70s at the places like uh, University of Edinburgh. And yeah. it was always very interesting that you had some people that were interested in, I suppose, what I would think of as the kind of the Alan Turing uh, sort of definition of intelligence, essentially making yeah. computers do things that look intelligent, regardless of whether this Gen genuinely mimics the way that we're intelligent and then other people that were far more interested in this with a view to kind of reverse engineering the human brain and genuinely doing sort of biofidelic uh, sort of artificial intelligence right you i suppose in, in a roundabout way my kind of question is how much of the focus of artificial intelligence today do you think is this idea of replicating human intelligence because it seems so interesting to me that so many of the ai 
sort of graduates that I know who, you know, certainly looked at areas like this in terms of their studies, you know, ultimately went off to work for companies like Google, where they're finding new ways to sell adverts. Or I I, I know that you mentioned uh, chatbots earlier and the fact that we've really struggled to create accurate chatbots, but certainly for a, a large part of the chatbot industry, it's not about genuine conversation. It's about finding ways to satisfy customer queries very, very quickly using different uh, sort of methodologies. So I apologize for the kind of the, the, the rambling question, but I just wondered how much of the focus of artificial intelligence do you see as trying to genuinely create artificial intelligence in, in, in the form of software? So I'll say one, one thing about this. Uh, one argument which has been made both personally and in writing is that when we say that you can't emulate human intelligence by means of a computer program, mm -hmm. they say, well, we're not trying to emulate human intelligence. We're trying to create something which is as powerful as a mm -hmm. human intelligence. It yes. can do many of the same things, but it might look completely different. And of course, we haven't proved that every completely different approach won't work. Yes. Uh, we think that our argument would apply to every completely different approach, but we couldn't go through all of them. And, and in any case, there may be an infinite number of completely different approaches. Yes. Uh, but we focus on what we think will have to be the main one, namely looking at what human beings do and what they say, because that's it's actually the one. Go ahead, Joe. Go. It's countably infinite only. <laughs> Oh, hang on! I'm losing. I'm, lo I'm losing you. Yeah, you're some it has to do with a number of theoretical. That's also with videos. Oh, so we, we've lost. Yeah, let's switch off our videos, maybe. Perfect. Yes. Hello, can you hear me again? Uh, oh, we yeah, can hear I, you now, but we're going yeah. to switch off our videos also. Yeah, please switch off your videos. I think. There we go. Now, 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 now that we've proven that we're all ostensibly humans. Do you still live in England, Luke? I do. I'm based in uh, Bristol. Oh, yes. Where, 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 where in uh, the UK were you living previous, previously? So I was born in Bolton. Okay. And um, I, I studied in Oxford and then went to Manchester to do my PhD. Ah, interesting. And then I stayed. I inherited the, the job of my PhD supervisor. So I stayed in Manchester for 14 years altogether. And then wow. I... I um I got a job in Liechtenstein, which was interesting. Fantastic. Do, do, do you venture back to the UK periodically? Uh, yes, but my, my parents are both dead, and um, I, I I have one remaining sibling. I see her occasionally, but I don't have many reasons to go back to the UK. I don't. Hello. I don't. Can hello, you hear me again now? Ahead. Yeah. Can you hear me again? Yes, I can hear you. I'm now using my phone as a network provider because I think it's more stable than the kids spoiled. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, sorry for that. Um, so I, I what I wanted to say is that there are basically two camps in the AI um, world. There's certainly still a camp that says we have to kind of mimic the human brain and how it works. And there's another camp who says, who is more like Alan Turing, they say, it doesn't matter how we do it, but it, it should provide have the functions of intelligence. Yes. And and um, both are, we think, failing for systematic reasons. Interesting. And, and I think the idea of really emulating the human brain as it works biologically is really silly. But there's quite a big school of people who believe in this, but they are really... It's very hard to take them seriously because they don't understand anything about the human brain. If they would, I mean, I was doing neuroscience, right? And that's where my skepticism also comes from because if you've done three years neuroscience, I was at the Max Planck Institute of Neurogenetics. Then you just know that you that there's no way to understand the brain. Only small parts can be understood. And believing it would be possible to really, you know, build a machine that works like the brain is just insane. It just yeah. shows it's le lack of education, basically. I was I was interested to ask about that because I mean I think that uh, of course the 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 artificial neural networks that uh, are, are sort of typically relied on today for machine learning 
are obviously very, very loose approximations of the human brain. So anytime someone says, oh, well, you could just scale up a neural network, then obviously that is missing a tremendous amount of, of, of nuance about uh, the way that the actual brain works. But I was interested to ask about whether you accept the proposition that fundamentally it's conceivable that we can replicate artificially the biological wetware of the brain. We're obviously not at the point where we understand how the brain uh, uh, sort of functions and where sort of uh, it, on, on, on that sort of granularity uh, 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 level and um, where sort of intelligence comes from. But I suppose the idea that intelligence, do you sort of believe the idea that intelligence or sentience or consciousness or however we sort of define general intelligence is rooted in the physical structure of the brain or and, and not some sort of non-visible component like, like like a soul as in is it technically possible if we understood the brain that that could then be mimicked artificially so barry can answer the second part um, and explain that we are not dualists but i will answer the first part and then i leave it to barry for the second part about about our view of the mind and the mind body continuum but to the first part first of all the name Neural networks, a complete misnomer. Um, the neural networks that we have now, even the most sophisticated ones, have nothing to do with the way the brain works. The brain, the, the view that the brain is a set of nodes interconnected in the way that neural neural networks are built is 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 completely naive and shows that people who do this either they are doing cynical advertisements or they really don't understand anything and are very naive. But but basically, you have to see that if you look at a single cell even the most primitive one like a bacterial cell we don't understand how it works we understand some of its aspects but we have no model of how it works and and let alone a neuron which is much more complicated than than a bacterial cell and let alone uh, billions of neurons interconnected so so it's just um it's just i believe it's scientifically impossible to understand how the brain works we can only understand certain aspects and deal with these aspects but we don't we will not get a full understanding of how the brain works. And, and, even, and if we would indeed have a perfect understanding of how each molecule of the brain works, then we could probably replicate it. Um, I mean, we, we, if we could, no, I have to refine it. If we could put the working of the human brain or let's say an animal brain to, 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 to take a little bit simpler, like for example, an ant, Yes. Um, this insect, you know, then we, could, if we would understand how its brain works perfectly, that means put everything into mathematical equations. Then we could replicate this using a computer. The problem is just that we are unable to to write down and create the equations that model this. And that's why we we can't re replicate the brain because we just don't know even the brain of an ant. We don't know how it works. Yes. Only very small aspects of it. And that's that's to answer the first part of your question. Now the second part: How do we how do we view the human mind? I, I leave to Barry. That's a philosophical question. Good. So uh, one of the implications of our general approach is that uh, many of the most interesting things in the world are uh, happening at levels uh, of um, uh, granularity which we cannot approach. We just don't have the imaging equipment and we, we probably never will have the image equipment, imaging equipment which can capture most of what's going on at the very fine levels of the brain. Yes. And what this means is that we we just don't know for instance what it, it, what it is which is responsible for consciousness. Um, we, we remain neutral. We don't have a, 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 a positive view about how the brain is conscious or the, the mind body continuum is conscious but we know that it is conscious uh, that's one of the things that we know very clearly we don't need imaging systems uh, yes. to know that and and if it, they, there are in fact a series of quite interesting philosophical problems which according to the method that we are taking uh, will always be unsolvable and so we should just ignore them so one of them is the freedom of the will so we are very strongly in favor of the idea that human beings have a will we we can want things we can decide things we can have intentions goals and so forth that's one of the reasons why the human technosphere is so impress impressive because we can will things over generations in large teams 
um, but we don't know whether it's free or not. Uh, that is an issue which has to do with the physics of the brain. And we just don't know enough about the physics of the brain and probably never will. But we don't care because we, we just talk about the will. We know that the will exists. We know that consciousness exists and so forth. And, um, and now what we also know, and here we, um, I don't think we have a, a strong positive argument, but we have a way of inferring that this is true. A computer can't have a will. So there cannot be an AI will. And I could give you the argument, but uh, I think I've said enough to, that you can see. Um, Interesting. Uh, yeah. You, you, you can see how it would take something very, very strange uh, on the level of granularity of what's inside the human brain to have a will. And there's no way in which you can have that strange thing inside a machine. Interesting. To, to sort of, oh, sorry. Before you, before you ask the next question, one more important point. So you asked whether we believe that what the mind does emerges from the physics of the brain. We believe that the man, what we experience as mental process, like sleeping, waking, consciousness, emotions, and so on, all of this is is a physical process. So we are yeah. monists. We believe that that everything we experience is physical. The point. So we are not dualists to believe that there's a separate entity which we call the soul and so on. Yes. And uh, at least not as scientists. And um, I live with the bird that I'm also Christian, but but I separate this from my scientific, uh, um, so to speak, worldview. But in my scientific worldview, there's only the physics, only the laws of nature that work and that create all this, what we experience in our brain. Yes. But now the important point is that we don't know how this happens. We cannot relate the fundamental laws of physics that we know up to the level of consciousness. And even if we even if we can observe everything, like in a bacterium, where we can observe all the movements of all the molecules, basically, and change them, and manipulate them in the way we want, even there, we cannot de deduce from the laws of physics what's going on in the bacterium. Yes. Interesting. The subtitle of the book, Artificial Intelligence Without Fear, what is the what is the fear that you that you see? So that was uh, from, provoked by um, the, the literature on the singularity, uh, which I know you're familiar with. So Nick Bostrom and the like. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. We, uh, we uh, when we were talking to our, our colleagues in the real world, ordinary people, in other words, we, we it became clear to us that there was indeed a certain fear among the populace that, that all of this AI would eventually take over and, and change the world to the detriment of humans. And when we've given talks on the book, they, they are really pleased because they don't need to worry about the, the world being taken over by, by machines. And so we, we, we have quite a lot in the book about uh, Bo the Bostrom type arguments. And, um, well, and I guess the, the core- Chalmers, David Chalmers. Uh, and, and Chalmers. Uh, the core argument against them is that if the machine cannot have a will, then it also cannot have an evil will. Yes. And without an evil will, then there's nothing to be afraid of. Now, of course, we can be afraid of machines just as we can be afraid of guns. But that's because the machines are being uh, managed by people with evil ends. Uh, but it's not the AI which is evil, then it's the people who build and uh, program the AI. That's an interesting point. Yeah, I was I, I was going to say, because I, I, I mean, I think that if you were to compile a list of the fears that people might have about artificial intelligence, of course, this um, idea of uh, sort of artificial general intelligence or the singularity would be one of those fears, but it certainly wouldn't be the only fear. And I think that one of the things that you mentioned there, which was very interesting, is the idea that, again, it's sort of the application of this. It's kind of the, the AI as gun kind of analogy. But yeah. I think for a lot of people, the, uh, the what, one, one of the fears which possibly comes between those two points, certainly closer to the, uh, the, 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 the managed, the sort of AI as gun, but not, not totally, is the idea of autonomous systems that aren't necessarily intelligent, but certainly would be making decisions not aided by um humans i mean Good. what 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 for yeah. you sort of presumably there are fears that extend beyond purely the idea of super intelligence it's not a case of nothing to worry about until we reach that point so so you're now touching upon a point that we don't cover so extensively in the book that's the question 
how AI can be abused for purposes of power. Yes. And and uh, we have, I have a, a, a presentation about this, not yet a paper because I didn't have the time to write it yet, that, that analyzes this really in depth. And um, Barry knows the presentation. I've given it for, at, at several universities. And at one occasion, Barry was present. And basically, I think that many of the fears are not really related to AI, but to digitization. So everything around propaganda using AI, influencing people using AI, um, uh, you know, social credit systems, that's not so much AI, it's more about the digitization of our world that allows to build kind of a Bentham-like panopticum, panopticum uh, yes. to, to supervise everyone. So this is something that a uh, real fear, but it is actually misattributed to AI because it, AI only plays a minor role in it. Yes, it, it can be used for face recognition and some other aspects, but the main things is rather is rather a digitization and and uh, super surveillance of people based on the fact that you can trace their movements, what they buy, how they use their money, and so on. And that's and that's and that's so that's a misapprehension of the problem. As with regards to autonomous agents, so I'm just reading a paper about aut autonomous agents written by people who worked in the defense industry. And they are very disappointed because they've realized that they are so far away from building autonomous um, autonomous uh, weapon systems. I mean, there are autonomous weapon systems, like the cruise missiles that we've had now for 40, over 40 years, but they are quite primitive. But, but because they can just fly to one goal and then destroy this goal, and, and they are based on rules that tell them whether they have now reached this goal, and if yes, then they can please detonate themselves. Yes. But 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 a, a system that can react to its environment, make decisions, is completely off the table right now. And the defense industry has recognized this. I, at least the clever people. And so 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 you know the classical picture is the kind of Terminator robot that walks around and autonomously kills people. That's it's just impossible to build it right now, and very very far off. And that has to do with our inability to even mimic human you know, um, uh, human uh, uh, perception. Yes. And and maybe if, if you want, Barry can can give details why we cannot um, em emulate human perception. So I would prefer to just to say that there could not be a Terminator kind of uh, phenomenon because there could not be a machine will. And you can only... Uh, behave as a terminator if you have uh, autonomy in the sense that you have desires of your own and it's it, it, there is just nothing on the horizon which would uh, g g lead to Very the belief Larry, that, that yes one could argue that that the terminator in the movies doesn't have a, a real you know autonomous will because it's it only follows strictly its order to kill a certain person and and kills everybody who who tries to put him or herself between the target person and the Terminator. So, okay, so that's still not but, autonomy then. Yes, it, but the point is that even only moving around in an open world and 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 correctly re identifying what's around. You know, when you watch the Terminator movie, Luke, you see sometimes the world from the perspective of the Terminator. Mm -hmm. And it identifies everything in, in red colors, you know. And then it, it it gives the impression that the Terminator can identify everything that it's looking for, and 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 so on. And that that's actually kind of a, a it, it assumes intentionality, not a full will, but intentionality. And already this is impossible to emulate, uh, emulate let alone uh, getting such an accuracy of of uh, of recognition of objects, which requires intentionality and active perception which we don't anyhow don't cannot emulate at all. So all we can do now is passive perception, like the perception of a, of a camera. Interesting. Uh, this, is connect, this intention idea is connected also with the reason why chatbots fail so often. So how do humans manage to have such um, consistent, uh, lively conversations, which change their subject over and over again, which, but which continue uh, meaningfully? Yes. Uh, the answer is because human beings have intentions. They want to achieve something by having conversations, even if it's only that the people they're talking to will think that they're clever or funny. And the, the, the robots, the chatbots, they don't have any intentions. Yes. And so there's no glue that helps them to, to attach themselves to the spirit of the conversation and, and make sense 
uh, they would be immediately spotted as being not really human. Um, I, I, I was interested to ask, when you talk about chatbots failing, how would you define that? Because, I mean, for example, if you were to take this conversation that we're having now, I'm very much enjoying interacting with both of you. But on some level, there's also a functional element to this conversation. I'm trying to extract information, which I'll then use to, to, to generate an article. So how, how, how do we sort of... Uh, um, yeah, I suppose. How, how, how are we sort of gauging failure when it comes to a chatbot, for example? So, so it depends what the chatbot is supposed to do. So if the chatbot asks you questions that only you can only answer by yes, no, or giving a number, then the chatbot can be very successful mm -hmm. because then it just it traverses together with you a predetermined tree of decisions at, at the end of which some business goal is achieved, like booking, for example, um, uh, hotel stay. Yes. But, but if the chatbot, but if the chatbot is supposed to uh, to speak to you freely, it will always fail because to speak freely, you you need to have intentionality. You need to have contextualization. You need to have you need to have a true understanding, inter intersubjectivity. So you need to have a true understanding. Machines cannot do anything of this. So if you if you speak to any chatbot that is built to emulate a true conversation and it will fail very, very quickly, very quickly, you will notice that it's not a human being. And, so and I, I think even the first kind of chatbot fails. So just think about your often, experience yes. with your bank's computers. It, the, the, when you're dealing with a human being in the bank, you know that you, if you have a really difficult problem, they will help you to find the solution or put you through to someone who will find the solution. Yes. But when you have to press zero or seven or, uh, and then wait a long time and then you, you, something goes wrong with seven and so you can't get any further, that is the more typical experience of, of dealing with a, a, a booking, a hotel booking or a plane booking or a bank. Mm -hmm. computers still they haven't been able to create answering services which behave like humans yes interesting and after 50 years they've been trying to do this for 50 years how what why why does this notion of the singularity or, or artificial general intelligence fascinate people and i wouldn't necessarily characterize all of it as fear there are certainly the sort of the ray kurzweil uh, uh school of this it, 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 people who it's almost a sort of a, a sort of religious um you yeah, know yeah. second coming kind of view of, uh, of 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 what the singularity could potentially mean but why is this something that resonates with people on such because, a a broad because, level yeah because it um it uh evokes the feeling of being a true creator there's a there's a you know since god is dead in the west which you know happened started at the at the beginning of the 19th century and then Nietzsche declared at the end of the 19th century god is dead and and basically since the elites of our society don't believe are not christians anymore they they needed they replaced god by the by the ego by the, by themselves and you can mm -hmm. see this in max stirner a colleague of, of Karl Marx, who worked at the same time, was also a pupil of Hegel, who wrote a book um, about this and who said, I myself, I am my own God. And so basically, then if you are a God, you also want to be a creator. Now, if you could create a super intelligence or an intelligence or a super intelligence, then you are like God. So I think it is it has to do with narcissistic, hyper narcissistic tendencies uh, in our culture. And and uh, that that exp I mean we don't talk about this in the book, but that explains to me why this idea is so attractive in our times in which there is no transcendent entity anymore to turn to. Interesting. So 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 to your to to, to process that then, it's the idea that the creation of AI is itself, or or, or, or the aim to create AI is itself a sort of narcissistic act, and then the idea that uh, that these creations would somehow become more powerful than, than than we are is the kind of the the nightmare flip side of that that's the kind of the child killing the parent a bit yes interesting um, so the, if there is a funny chapter in the book it's the chapter called digital immortality which yes. uh, uh, begins by discussing the reason why people go to see um uh, marvel films the the, the infinity stones Yes, uh, kind of idea. And that's because they want to um, bathe themselves into this 
um, level of heaven and hell and 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 um, multiple different possible futures and 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 so forth. It, 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 you're carrying yourself up into a kind of cosmic level. Yes, and uh, so, the singularity is the same kind of thing. Yeah. We we think. Schleiermacher, Schleiermacher, German philosopher and theologian, he discovered that there is a religious need in everyone, in humans. And, and it, he also said that if the religious need is not any more fulfilled by true religion, there will be a new type of religion. And I think that's what we are seeing. That's a would you would you mind spelling that name? I, I I'm embarrassed that yeah, I, I will put it in the that. chat. That so, would be wonderful. Uh, Oh, that's so that's, that's the name. Uh, wonderful, thank you. Um, re recently, there was a Google engineer. Hang on a second, let me just save that very quickly. Recently, there was a Google engineer who was fired in part for vocally claiming that uh, one of Google's uh, uh, Lambda uh, language models was sentient because it claimed that it was. Um, how seriously should we take these claims? Well, and, and, and I mean, this is obviously just the latest iteration of this, but some variation of this has played out, certainly at least since, you know, the Eliza chatbot. Yes. Especially, and I suppose the complexity, or not, maybe not the complexity, but the interesting twist on sort of what you said earlier is where we were talking about the fact that we don't yet understand how the brain functions on every level, and we may never do. We we don't have objective tests for for measuring sentience in in other humans. We just assume it when we're having a conversation with other with other humans. So, how how, how much? Um, Sort of not 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 uh, sort of uh, uh, yeah I suppose how 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 seriously should we at least consider these claims when they're periodically made? So I would say that there are three uh, pieces of information which justify the assumption that there are other minds. Uh, one is that our neural neurological systems are so similar, and we evolved uh, from the same through the same evolutionary pathway. So. If, if you are conscious, then it's very likely that the people who developed in just the same way that you did, uh, for instance, your brothers and sisters, that they are also conscious. Yes. Secondly, we, um, we join together. We have common projects. We can convince each other. We can be convinced by other people. Uh, and this is all about having goals and intentions again. Um, the, the, if, if they didn't have um, consciousness, then they couldn't have goals and intentions. But they are, they join with us constantly. Every every human interaction involves constant uh, interactions between goals and intentions. So that's what keeps conversations alive, as I said a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. And um, and then the, the I've forgotten what the third reason is, but I think those two reasons are are good enough. Interesting. So so you know so, so so to bring it back to the the, the, well, the, the, the Google reason. engineer. Yeah. So I think the third reason is that, that we can um, commit suicide. No animal can commit suicide. No, no other entity can commit suicide. And I think the, the, the ability of human beings to commit suicide is the third reason, Barry not yet mentioned, and the strong, I think it's a very strong one. And it, it has, has also been philosophically discussed many times, but I believe that the ability to, to, to perform suicide shows that we are... Uh, self-conscious and because everyone has the potential i have the potential so by the first argument gave barry gave everyone has the potential and be, be able to commit suicide is so so a computer couldn't do couldn't commit suicide a computer could not uh, have an agreement with someone else a co computer could not care for someone could not have intersubjectivity and all of this is is uh is part of the higher uh, consciousness uh that we have and yes and, uh, uh so, so this Google is behaving very strangely towards its employees, um, uh, and uh, I think it is very much basically um, trying to avoid to avoid uh, damage to its business that could happen via social media. And I think that's another guy who was fired was somebody who complained about the 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 you know. Um, internal policies at Google two years ago. He was also fired. I, I, they have a habit of firing people who say what they think. Mm -hmm. So but then, let, let me just try one. This isn't the third reason. It, this is a, 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 a wrinkle on the first reason. Yes, mm -hmm. I agree. So when, when Lambda uh, makes this, uh, uh, produces this string, 
then that is not like what we do when we say in a philosophical conversation or wherever it might be, I am conscious. Yes. It, it's a completely different kind of process. And we have no reason to accept that it is an assertion. An assertion is more than just the production of a certain uh, pattern of sounds from a machine. And I remember I said that in every minute of every day, we are involved in realizing intentions. That's yeah. the case when we are co having conversations. Now, that machine doesn't have a will. That was axiom number three earlier on. Uh, and so it didn't have intentions. And so it is not making an assertion. What it does um, is, is just creating a sequence of symbols that have been computed in a way that we understand quite well by a sequence model. A sequence model is a set of instructions that was created by a human being by using um, a certain optimization algorithm that is used to compute a relationship between input and an output sequence. Mm -hmm. And and this, this, this algorithm is described in our book in chapter eight, how it, in chapter nine, how it works. It's a set of, of instructions. It's Turing computable. We, are, we understand quite well how it works. I mean, not the very details because it's a very long equation, but it's, 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 it is just the machine is following executions that have been defined through and through by engineers. Um, yes. that, has, that is basically uh, like saying when, when a lion jumps through a hoop, or how do we call it? Yeah, or, or does something that was taught, an animal does something that was, it was trained to do, that it has now developed um, a skill out of its own. No, it's just, it has been conditioned to, to do a certain trick because it has received rewards after doing the trick. But, but if it would not be repeating the trick every day and, you know, and, and, and be, so, so to speak, um, if this training wouldn't be kept up, it, it would stop doing it. And you can, a bit, you can imagine what's going on in the computer. It's just trained. Um, uh, by human beings in a, in a very clear and systematic way to create this. And it has, it has really nothing to do with what happens when a human being utters something. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, if human level intelligence is not replicable um, uh, 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 for, for the reasons that we discussed earlier, where do you see the, the upper limit being? I mean, for example, I know that uh, there have been attempts to replicate the nervous system of the tiny sort of worm-like creatures uh, 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 C. elegans, uh, al albeit not yet in a sort of satisfactory way, but in terms of the relative complexity of of of, of the sort of the, the the brains and the sort of neurological systems, what do you see it as conceivable that we may be able to create artificial sort of replicas of a bee or a housefly or a, a mouse? I mean, it seems a sort of frivolous question on some level, but is there a sort of a cutoff that you see as reasonably plausible? I mean. It's, it's a bit like one of the first questions you asked. So if we look at biological systems, so there are, there are two basic ways to model biological systems. One way is to write a, a differential equations, partial differential equations, which are explicit mathematical model to models to model dynamic events in the universe. It's basically the technique that, that Newton and Leibniz invented to describe phenomena in nature. And, yes. and for, for some, for a very small set of phenomena, these partial differential equations, which usually involve up to five or six variables, or maybe 10 at most, but only rarely, mostly two, three, four, five, six variables. These equations work for, for a limited set of problems in inanimate nature, mm -hmm. but they don't work at all to describe animate nature, only very partial aspects of it. But you cannot model a cell, the neuron of, of C. elegans, just one of them, using such a, a set of equations. And uh, this is what Laplace was dreaming of. Laplace, at the beginning of the 19th century, he was dreaming of modeling the world using partial differential equations, but it, it, fa it failed. And so the other way is to try to create such models using, um, using implicit models, which is what machine learning does. Now comes one of our strongest arguments. I believe it is the strongest of the book. The reason why we cannot do this for living systems is that we cannot create sample sets that are representative of their behavior. So because living systems, they, they behave, they, the distribution that their behavior yields is um, non-ergodic. That's a very important key term in the book. So they don't yield ergodic distribution. So an ergodic distribution is a distribution in which when you draw a sample from somewhere in the distribution and you do this often enough, then you, you can model the distribution. 
But if the distribution is non-ergodic, you can draw as many samples as you want. You will never achieve a model of the distribution. And that is what's happening with living systems. And that's why all the training material that we gain from living systems, when we put them into machine learning, we always only get models that are quite poor because, because the technology, the technique of drawing samples and teaching a machine based on the samples we draw from the distribution fails if the distribution is non-ergodic. Yes. And that, that's a, one of the core reasons why we cannot create machine learning AI systems that work <laughs> for living systems. So I believe that we will not model the brain of the ant um, or say elegance. Yes. And that's also the key reason why people have given up the idea of using AI to get rich on the stock market. Interesting. Um, one, one final uh, uh, question then. What for you would be the ultimate outcome of, of, of your book if everyone was convinced by your arguments? What would you, what would you like to see the kind of the future development of, of AI or the sort of the decisions made by people, again, if they were fundamentally convinced by everything that you argue in the book? What's the kind of the way, the way forward with this as a discipline? Do you want to go first, Barry, should I? Um, you go first, since I don't have anything on the tip of my tongue, yeah. which is well, an I, unusual experience. It's, it's, a, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good question, Luke. And um, I can tell you exactly what I think would happen. So I think it will happen. I think in the midterm, people will, will accept our arguments. And this will create better applied mathematics. Because and that, that's something that all great sci many great mathematicians and physicists were completely aware of like Einstein and Planck and Schrödinger and Bohr and, and uh, um, Heisenberg. Oh, yes, uh, yes. They, they were aware of the limitations of what they could achieve mathematically. Because, of the, because they were aware of this, they were focusing on certain problems. So being a good physicist means that you are, have a feeling for which problems can be subjected to a mathematical resolution and analysis. So if you are really well aware of the limitations, then you go through the world and look for these problems and solve them. That's how Einstein found, um, uh, found the, the, the equations for the Brownian motion, how he came up with a the special theory and later the general theory of relativity, how Planck solved black body radiation, because they had a good instinct for which problems are amenable to solution with mathematics and which are not. So if we focus, if people learn the message from our book, they will just be able to engineer better systems because they will concentrate on what is truly feasible and stop wasting money and effort on something that can't be achieved. Um, so, but I think that it will st still take a while because the field is still there. Are still a lot of people who, who don't understand that, that there are essential limitations to what the human mind can achieve. And, and they, they will have to learn it and it can, can take a, a generation or two but ultimately, I think uh, I think uh, people will understand that we are right, and that will lead to better, better applied mathematics, better AI. So I think that the, some of the message is already getting through, not because of what we say, but because of the experiences people have when they give large amounts of money to AI projects, and then the AI project fails. Yes. So this happened. I guess you know about the Jake, the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center. Mm -hmm. I, I can't remember the exact sum, but I think it was $10 billion, which they gave to a famous contractor. And uh, in the end, they got nothing out of it. They canceled the contract. And we also have a chapter in the book that talks about how AI, so it's called, it's the last chapter, um, the future of AI, I don't know how it's called, but it basically describes how we see the field evolving once people understand about the limitations. And I think it will just become much better. It, it's very strange because if you look, let's say, for example, at applied nuclear physics, in applied nuclear physics, they were really modest. Yeah, so they, they said we can create, um, we can create a, a nuclear fission in an uncontrolled way. Then they realized that was a nuclear fission bomb. Then, uh, then they, re they realized that they can also create this in a controlled way, which is a nuclear power plant. And they also realized that the same is true for fusion, so that they can first realize the uncontrolled fusion, which is the hydrogen bomb, and that they are now need a few centuries more maybe to realize controlled fusion. So they, they are much more systematic. And I think that in AI, they are less systematic, which has to do with the fact that it's a discipline in which there are so many engineers who have no, math, no training in mathematics and physics, whereas in the nuclear, applied nuclear physics field, 
they were only physicists and mathematicians of very of the highest training. I mean, think of the people in the Manhattan Project. And and I think that that in AI there are it's a much broader field. So I think there's much less you know cleverness and mathematical knowledge in this field, which is one of the reasons why it's stumbling along and developing such strange ideas. Yes, and I think one associated factor is that the people who live in the world of computers from the age of early teenage uh, years, uh, they, uh, they, they find it hard to think of the real world as being different from the world inside the computer. Yes. And so Schmidt Huber really believes that the whole of reality is representable in, in terms of what you can uh, build inside a computer. And so well, you don't need the real world. You can just build a model inside the computer and then you're home. So this is like a bit like if you know games like Doom or other ego shooter games, right? Where you mm -hmm. have a, a, a where you have a, a closed world that is consists only of linear algebra. Of course, their computers outperform humans and so on. And and Schmidtuber and people like Schmidtuber tend to confound this world of co this controlled world with the real world. And um, this is he's a good example of I think <clears throat> lack of understanding of nature as it is really. But if you listen to Karl Mogorov or, or um, or even Maxwell or many, many, you know, great physicists, you see that they they have they have worked with nature as it really is. And so they have a much better understanding of how how tiny the proportion of the world that surrounds us is that we can model with using mathematics. Interesting. Fantastic. Well, thank you both so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. It's been a, a, a fascinating, uh, it's a fascinating book and it's been a really enjoyable conversation. So uh, many, many thanks 